Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me again for another interview series. Christina here. I'm the gallery manager at River Arts on Water Gallery. During this whole pandemic shutdown, we decided we're going to interview some of our artists um, that are part of River Arts on Water Gallery, sort of connect a face with the artwork that you may have seen in the past. So I'm really excited to welcome John Paulus with me. John, thanks for joining me. Hey, how are you doing? I'm not too bad. How are you holding in there? Wonderful. Just dandy. <laughs> dandy. Enjoying the sunshine that's out there. Yeah, it definitely doesn't feel like there's a global crisis going on. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, John, you joined the gallery uh, as an artist in 2016. I'm wondering. Wow, really? When, yeah, it's been a little Man, while. I feel like it's crazy. That. Time um, flies. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your art and what you like to make and the media that you work with. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I grew up in Ripon, Wisconsin, uh, kind of in the central area of Wisconsin, in the, near the Fox Valley, uh, Oshkosh, Appleton area. Um, and my parents are blacksmiths and uh, steel workers. Uh, my great grandparents on my mom's side are, you know, we have a lot, long line of, of blacksmiths and metal workers in the family, along with artists and designers and stuff. So it just, I think it's in our bloodline a little bit. Um, so I got hooked into metalworking around the age of 12 or so. Okay. Um, and yeah, my parents just kind of, I think they knew that I, they could get free labor out of me, <laughs> <laughs> but I think there was a little bit of that involved, but it was also just a really fun thing to learn. And, um, we weren't, you know, the richest of people. So, uh, instead of daycare, I would just hang out at the shop while they worked. And, um, so it was kind of just faded to learn the ways of metalworking um you kind of so yeah, doing anything else yeah yeah i started my dad started me with you know working with nails and wood to make little boats because we had a little river next to the studio and we float these little boats we made um and then you yeah, know started working with copper and bending that and it's really easy to manipulate it's not as hard of a metal okay. and then as uh, i got into that it started you know it's like well can i just try welding because it's just such a neat um yeah, such a cool kind of like wizardry type of uh, process. And he finally, he finally uh, coaxed my mom into letting me wear the welding helmet. And um, by the time I was 13 or so, I was doing full bore welding projects and just, you know, making stuff out of their scrap materials. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. And by high school, I was just, you know, really, I was helping them out with making flowers. And I, I wasn't doing the conventional um you know, blacksmith thing. It was more so like just uh, taking whatever scraps they had and then making my own things out of it. So nowadays it's kind of a, it's a pretty, uh, there's a very wide variety of people all over the world using recycled materials, uh, mm -hmm. especially in the industrial steel department. There's just so much extra scraps out there. So it's, it's a pretty neat thing to be a part of now. Um, but yeah, now I'm just, um, going around farms in the area here uh, in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. So we're just 30 minutes away from the gallery in Prairie du Sac. And uh, yeah, and everywhere around here, there's just so much cool uh, industrial projects going on um, and pastoral, you know, uh, scenes. They all deal with broken chains and, you know, farm equipment breaking. So they throw away a lot of just scrap material um, that can easily be turned into uh, neat works of art. Um, yeah. But yeah, with the, I, I really enjoy, um, right now, I, I really enjoy going back to old sketchbooks from college. Um, I went to the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh and uh, really loved figure drawing. I was going to get a degree in drawing, but I was like, well, <laughs> you know, there's not, not to say that there's much, you know, you got to really work hard to get, you know, to get your uh, money's worth out of an art degree. But um, I hear you. I, I I really enjoyed I really enjoyed just taking the figure and um, now I'm, I'm kind of taking those 2D renderings and and kind of manipulating them into steel projects. Okay. Um, I just love the the figure in art and the history behind it is so. Uh, there's a lot of metaphors you can put into the human f uh, form. Um, sure. And I think right now, especially too, it might just be with the social distancing that like <laughs> making humans <laughs> is kind of just like my remedy for being, <laughs> hey, it makes I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm an extrovert. And so to not like be surrounded by anybody, but my wife and my toddler 
uh, it's like I, I need some people around, so I'm just <laughs> building them. It's, kind of, it's getting weird. <laughs> Just let me know when you start giving them voices. Yeah, I'm not talking. I'm not talking to them yet. They're not talking to me, at least. They're, they're not telling me to do things. So that's good. <laughs> so would you say that using recycled materials is still a really big part of what you do today? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually in the shop right now, and I can just pan. This is, yeah, the, yeah, out, this, this is the outside right now. It's just scraps galore. I don't even know what's going on out there. Um, <laughs> okay. Ever since the when the snow melts, I'm just always surprised, like, oh, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out here. <laughs> you just so kind of luckily, keep stuff outside over the winter. Yeah, I mean, most of most of what I've done in the past is is a rusty finish uh, anyway. So I kind of work alongside, and it, I'm kind of lazy when it comes to finishing uh, my sculptures. So rust is just uh, such a kind of an, an inevitable force um, when it comes to steel. So you're, it's just kind of a and a lot of folks that buy sculptures for outdoor settings, especially if you're doing like public work or if you're doing like a sculptures for like a private home, um, they don't really necessarily want to worry about the surface changing over time. So yeah. I've gone with this, I call it a patina, but it, it you know, it, it's rust, but it's a, uh, you can manipulate it in ways to make it very elegant. Like there's a lot of different um, qualities to the color, you know, the orange just the, the degrees of rust is really, there's a lot to play with with that. But okay. yeah, so, so I mostly keep as much as I can outside, but if I pan over here, this is the other, the other side of the studio. And so I have this big uh, rack for, for basically for long rods of stock that I, I do purchase for armatures. Okay. Um, and then there's just, you know, I, this is my, my new project for every spring. It's just like, I have to, go back and clean up after my my four month period of just making and breaking things you know not not cleaning up after myself so you're looking at about four or five months of just mess <laughs> <laughs> sort of I have very I have very patient neighbors and a patient patient uh, family <laughs> that's good all right <laughs> <laughs> um my next question then would be who would you consider <clears throat> all of your artistic um influences like who do you, who inspires you? Are, are there artists that you like to follow or is it pretty much out of your own head or? Yeah, there's, I mean, like I was saying, like I was saying earlier, I think um, right now, I mean, I, I had some really great, um, two, two specific professors that come to mind that really inspired me to kind of keep in the educational process to, because I was, I was a terrible student. It took me like four years just to graduate from like, gym you know I failed gym like four times I just hated I just don't like the whole process of education I guess but um the, these two I had a drawing professor named uh, Mark Brugman and another uh 2D uh professor uh named Lee Hu and they both were just such amazing uh artists that their visions were very uh palpable and the way that they could speak about it was really um uh, compelling and I think that's basically what I learned from um, from my educational experience and in, in getting a Bachelor of Fine Arts is just being able to not only like take what you are envisioning in your head and put it to paper or put it to a material but also be able to, to talk about it um, right. and kind of back up what you're thinking because you know the, the imagination and uh, you know that we all have in the creative process without having some sort of a, a meaning behind it it can be lost for so that not everyone really understands like as, there's a lot of esoteric art out there that just like what does this mean you know and, and right. there's a lot of a lot of jargon and stuff behind it but it, if you're just trying to make art that kind of makes people happy to have like a little bit of meaning behind it and to have to be able to talk about it's really and now I stumble trying to express talking about art but I haven't talked to people in a while <laughs> it's amazing what two weeks of social distancing does to your brain it's like whoa right. people I literally there were like four people that stopped at the shop just looking in and I just like tore my welding helmet off I was like hey guys and they're just they like cringed at me I'm like oh sorry <laughs> I, we were all just kind of like on eggshells you know Oh, that's, that's crazy. Cool. Either way, though, going back to uh, inspirations, there's um, the beauty of the digital age and, and uh, you know, social media. There's so many 
amazing artists that are like celebrities in my mind that mm -hmm. I can just contact and message and and kind of poke the bear and be like hey how are you doing that like what's your secret sauce that you're throwing into this whole ingredients to make that yeah you know to turn that washer into an eyelid or you know just to get get that close to uh to the creative um genius behind certain people that are really inspiring like i get to talk to a guy named john lopez who's out i believe it's south dakota it could be north dakota uh i think it's south dakota though but he's amazing just an amazing sculptor and he he does bronze work uh but he also does scrap steel sculptures that are just mind-blowing mm -hmm. um and he has a whole gamut of people from all over the world um who kind of magnetized towards him via the internet and um so you, you kind of it's a big ripple effect which is really neat there's a lot of um amazing african uh, steel sculptors and, and australian i noticed in the last couple months of just well especially in the last like two weeks of just kind of sitting around uh glazing over you know just yeah. <laughs> sitting uh, sitting on instagram my fingers are like i have calluses on my fingers from all the uh scrolling. screen screen <laughs> scrolling god um but either way and I, I just really find that really compelling the name's kind of a i'm going more on a visual i'm on a visual uh <laughs> escapade mm -hmm. the last couple of years that uh, when I was in college, I could have listed off a whole bunch of artists that really uh, inspired me. But I, I, oh, I always think of Brancusi for like the like the classics, yeah. um, and Giacometti, of course, is just amazing. Yeah. Um, just the taking taking the figurative form and kind of just breaking it down and um, giving it a style that's that hasn't been seen before is really a neat neat thing. I think another thing that uh, the inspiration of just the internet in general being able to talk and find all these people that are working uh, in your specific medium um it kind of gives you an idea of what the collective uh like what's in style or in vogue or whatever you know what it kind of again it's also a competitive thing almost too it's like well i can make a fish way cooler <laughs> than that or you know it's, there's there's got to be I, I feel like there's got to be a sense of competitiveness in that the field of art to really like keep pushing yourself because you can just kind of be staring at a wall and uh call yeah suddenly it, it just becomes sort of irrelevant after a while right to try try and keep within the realm of like what's what what is the world kind of how how's the whole world looking at this uh yeah. this type of medium and take it to the next level is kind of fun whatever you find on on a google search just try to do the exact opposite and see how that goes for a little <laughs> bit too it's just fun that's a good piece that, of advice. So if yeah, you just, could, I'd love to ask you about a little bit of the functional side. So you've talked mm -hmm. about your inspiration with drawing and the figure. Do you yeah. often take an idea, put it on paper, and then it becomes sculpture? Or do you go right from idea to working in metal? Um, it kind of depends. Um, lately, I've been going back to some old, really like dusting off some really old um, sketch journals and just looking at what was going on back in the day when I was welding with flip flops instead of boots and just seeing like what, <laughs> what I could grab from that. And uh, now it's, you know, I, it all depends. I think mainly I'll go from like a, a, a sketch and actually do a lot of conceptual preliminary drawings for, um, for uh, private uh, commissions like custom work or, or public, any sort of com uh, commission. Okay. If someone comes to the studio or contacts me and wants uh, a specific piece um, in my style, then I'll I'll send them. Yeah, you know, we'll spend a week to a couple months just kind of drawing out ideas, and I'll throw them at my wife and see what she thinks. And you know, and I can send them off to certain buddies that are you know that have a good eye, and they'll give me some mm -hmm. critiques. And and that that's when I really go from like drawing to 3D. But in when I'm just in my studio, like the last couple of weeks, besides looking at other sketchbooks, I'm not really, I'm just drawing from the sketches. I'm not really taking the exact sketch and going, you know, sketch to, to 3D. So that's been, it's, it's kind of, I, I got to keep, uh, keep it fresh or else it just isn't fun. It suddenly yeah. becomes work. I don't want to be like feeling like I'm working, <laughs> 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 which is, yeah, it may make me sound like a, total 
total a-hole but you know just, <laughs> if this if this becomes work it's like oh gosh <laughs> you know? and you're doing something wrong God. yeah yeah although it is a lot I mean it's a ton of work there's so much behind the scenes stuff that uh, luckily my wife is a huge fan of doing like our managerial stuff so I just have to tie my boots on right and get to the shop on time so I have like a good six hours a day to to really get something accomplished but um yeah there's just so much stuff we we do a lot of art fairs so I don't know how that's going to go this season with uh okay. what's been going on um hopefully this all kind of blows over before that uh usually July is our big big season so or big month of the, okay. of the year so but either way I think um you know we're, we're optimistic even in the face of reality so we'll yeah. just keep pushing away oh yeah can be. Yeah. All right. Well, my next set of questions, I usually wrap up every interview by asking everybody the same set of three questions and the yeah. one word answers, or they can be some longer explanations if you want. So sure. the first question for you is, and you kind of already answered this, when you work in your studio, would you consider yourself very neat or are you kind of messy when you work? Uh, I always think I'm, I'm extremely self-conscious about people coming into my shop just because I feel like I'm a tornado in here when I'm working and then it's just like oh my god there's so much dust and jagged edges and stuff but I don't know whenever people come in to like especially if a client comes in to check out what I'm working on for them they'll just be like wow this is a really interesting and creative spot I'm like okay I don't I think it's a total mess. But, so I'd call myself a yeah. The only yeah, the only way you can make any. I think it's so fun to think about like people deem art as these as like beautiful forms and these like amazingly precious things that are are you know coveted. But if if everyone saw where it was made, it's it's kind of interesting. It's like the uh, yeah behind the curtain it, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. My buddy calls calls the shop Mordor. <laughs> I, uh, I can't say that there's much I hate about it because I uh, just going through this um, this big you know world crisis. A lot of people are changing their ways of living extremely in an extreme way, and we really haven't had to do much. Um, so I'm very very blessed and thankful for that. Uh, the pet peeves, I don't have many. <laughs> okay, right. All right, and one final question for you. Um, can you tell us either about the best piece of advice you've ever been given or your advice to anyone who maybe is interested in pursuing the arts? Yeah. Um, you know, this, that's a, that is a, there's a lot I could go on for hours about the different pieces of advice I've gotten from, from all my, you know, from family members and, and, uh, mentors but there's one that i i've been thinking about a lot lately uh, just in the recent couple last couple of weeks and uh my drawing professor from oshkosh who passed away a couple of years back um lee who he always he had very he couldn't really understand he had kind of a pretty pretty broken english he's chinese and he uh he would always take your pencil away from you if you had a question and just like finish your drawing for you okay. and do it perfectly right. and he would just say he would just say oh the shadow the shadow and they just whisper that and like it's almost hypno hypnotic but after that he'd be like you're focusing on the light but in order to find the light you need to focus on the darkness and I'm like whoa that's some that's some <laughs> met metaphorical stuff that's deep yeah mm -hmm. he was just talking about the literal like the dark and light yeah. in the in the in you know in a sketch but but i think you know a lot of artists and i've been through so many dark moments and and those dark moments I was focusing on as like little pockets of creativity for so long. And that's, that it, I did make some really amazing, I felt like for the last like decade, I've been focusing on like utilizing my, my dark times and my down times, like mentally, physically, just feeling depressed as a, as a, like a muse. And I really, I advise anyone that's that's really wanting to make it as an artist and live a fulfilled life and a happy life as an artist you don't need to be in your dire straits to have the muse slap you in the face yeah um, i have been trying to focus lately on just like on being as light-hearted as possible throughout 
all this stuff, especially now. I mean, uh, the empathy and, and the, the light that you find in daily stuff is so uh, vibrant and there's just so much you can, you can build off of with that. And uh, that's something that I've just recently been trying to work on more and, and it has been, it's been making the workload so much easier. It's been making everything um, a much, much uh, higher priority uh, just to keep making things. And that it, it did take those dark moments though. So I would just advise don't, don't focus on, on getting yourself to those dark moments. If you are going through darkness, use art to get out of it. Um, and I guess.